My name is Shuaib, I'm one of the co-founders of Bite Medicine, and it's an absolute pleasure to have so many of you tuning in on a Thursday evening to join us on our 90th webinar on shortness of breath. So welcome, welcome. <clears throat> Just some housekeeping. If you have any questions, post them in the Q&A. Um, only use the chat if you really need to, because sometimes it can get a bit clogged up. So use the Q&A section to post questions. Um, other than that, sit back and enjoy. Hopefully you can all see my slides. What will we be covering today? We'll be covering how to approach shortness of breath. It's a very common presentation um, and more of a practical guide of what you do in reality in the hospital and a way for you guys to figure out what's urgent and what's not urgent. Ultimately this is going to be helpful for real life but also for your exams. We're going to cover four cases, four common shortness of breath presentations to the emergency department or to the GP. Um, I know we have a lot of international students. Um, these guidelines that I will talk about will mainly be focused around the UK guidelines, but it's all pretty similar. We'll also touch on some chest x-ray and spirometry um, data interpretation, and this should last roughly an hour. The slides and recordings are on the website. Um, so this recording will go up in about 48 hours or so, and all of our previous webinars are recorded. Um, also as part of Bite Medicine, we have a question bank, which is a case-based approach taking you right through from first steps through to diagnosis, management, and pathology and we have an in-depth textbook covering now almost 300 odd conditions so please do sign up um, you can use my discount code to get 20 to 30 percent off uh, so do use that when you sign up and you'll get a discount and as i said with membership you can have access to all of our recordings um, whereas without membership you only have access to a portion of those recordings i can see someone's having some trouble hearing let me just address that Okay, let's get started. So shortness of breath, what is shortness of breath? It's, well, it's difficulty in breathing, it's fast breathing. Okay, and the key thing to distinguish is whether it's acute or chronic, because um, that will help guide your diagnosis. If it's acute, we're talking about days, and if it's chronic, we're talking about months. Um, and different diagnoses will cause different timescales. Shortness of breath is a very common presentation to A&E and primary care. Okay, so that's why you need to know this inside out. It's another one of those common presentations like chest pain, like abdominal pain. The causes are respiratory, cardiovascular, those are the two main ones. And then we have other, you know, a bunch of other conditions which are probably not as common as the respiratory and cardiovascular causes. So in the chat, if you list some differentials, that would be great. And then we'll come on to what exactly the differentials that I have listed are. Pneumothorax, PE, heart failure, MI, COPD, angina, asthma, COVID, pneumonia. Very good, very good. Bronchiolitis in, in children, very good. We'll be covering mainly adults here, but yes, allergies. Um, okay, panic attack. Good. Typoscoliosis, anemia, Guillain-Barre. Wow, these are some great differentials and they're all correct. Okay. So the way I've divided it is into acute and chronic, because as I said, that's the most important distinction. Shortness of breath, which has come on over a couple of days, in general, is going to be much more serious and urgent than shortness of breath, which has been going on for months. In general, things which come on quickly from an emergency department point of view are far more urgent and need to deal with immediately compared to things which have been going on for months. Um, so just to give you some background about myself, I've worked a fair amount in the emergency department and as well as on 
sort of medical wards and I'm going to give you my experience of what you need to do. So if we think about acute causes of shortness of breath, remember respiratory, cardiovascular, other. So respiratory should be all touched on asthma, COPD, so asthma exacerbation, also known as an asthma attack, COPD exacerbation, pulmonary embolism, pneumonia, pneumothorax, pleural effusion, and acute airway obstruction. So for whatever reason, whether that's a foreign body, someone swallowed something and they're choking, or if for some reason they've got an infection in the head and neck and that's compressing the airway, that is an acute cause of shortness of breath. Cardiovascular causes, acute coronary syndrome, we touched on this last week in my chest pain webinar, so that's myocardial infarction, unstable angina. Acute heart failure, arrhythmia, aortic dissection, and cardiac tamponade. So I think everyone's probably quite comfortable with the respiratory and cardiovascular causes of shortness of breath, but the more niche ones are come under other. So when you're seeing a patient who's presenting with shortness of breath in the emergency department, you need to think, could this be sepsis? Does the patient have a source of infection? Could this be diabetic ketoacidosis, a very another you know, important cause of shortness of breath? Anaphylaxis, is there some allergic trigger does the patient have stridor? Do they have an urticarial rash? Okay, very important. These things kill, okay? Sepsis, DKA, anaphylaxis, blood loss will be obvious because the patient will be bleeding. Or less urgent, but also important to recognize, is this anxiety. Anxiety can cause hyperventilation and sometimes can get caused for a physical cause of shortness of breath. Less urgent considerations are chronic causes. So stable asthma, stable COPD, a chronic infection like tuberculosis, interstitial lung disease, also known colloquially as fibrosis, bronchiectasis, long-standing pleural effusions, occupational lung disease, lung cancer. These are all still very important, but they're not gonna kill the patient imminently whereas all of these acute things minus psychogenic causes can kill a patient, okay? Chronic heart failure, ischemic heart disease, cardiomyopathy, those are the chronic cardiovascular causes of shortness of breath. And finally, anemia and chest wall deformity. So someone cleverly mentioned kyphoscoliosis. Uh, there are, I'm sure, other causes of shortness of breath, but you know we'd end up having an endless list. So I've just limited it to these main differentials. So when someone comes into the emergency department, comes into the GP and you're the doctor or the physician's associate seeing the patient, you can think of number one, is this acute? Number two, is this chronic? Um, and beyond that, is this respiratory? Is this cardiovascular or is this other? And then you can figure out which box you're looking at here and therefore work out what the most likely differential is. So, just briefly, uh, you know, I'm sure you guys are very good with your history taking, but we have a wide range of um, students from first year to final year. So I'm just going to very briefly touch on some key points with regards to history taking. Remember, the key thing is, is it acute or is it chronic? Really important. After that, you want to figure out the timing. So is it there all the time? Does it come and go? Is it diurnal? So diurnal means in the morning and in the night. It's worse, morning and night. What's that classic of? Diurnal shortness of breath should ring, should flag a certain diagnosis in your mind. Asthma, very good. So for those of you who have asthma or those of you who have studied asthma, you'll know that the shortness of breath is worse in the morning and worse at night, okay? Patients are often coughing throughout the night. They wake up breathless. That's classic of asthma. And that's reflected in the peak flow as well. The peak flow will be worse in the morning and worse at night. What makes it better? What makes it worse? You know, does going to work make it worse? Uh, is there some sort of allergy they're experiencing at work? Does exertion make it worse? Walking up the stairs, for example, that's very classical of angina, shortness of breath and chest pain, worse on exertion. Are they taking a medication which is triggering their shortness of breath? Or do any medications make it better, like salbutamol, for example? All important questions. 
associated symptoms. So in your OSCEs, you must ask specifically for this in a shortness of breath station. Is there a cough? Is it dry, productive, or blood? Do they have a wheeze? Do they have any chest pain? Do they have any palpitations? Any evidence of heart failure? You must ask specifically if they've got orthopnea, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, or ankle swelling. So orthopnea is breathlessness on lying flat. Paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea is when patients wake up breathless. And ankle swelling is obviously peripheral edema. So these are all symptoms related to heart failure. And in general, you know, is there any fever, weight loss, night sweats? So two differentials I want if a patient comes in saying, I've got shortness of breath, I have fever, weight loss, and night sweats. What are the two differentials that should come to your mind immediately? TB is one and cancer is the other. Good. So in general, if you have kind of an, an old smoker coming in with, you know, shortness of breath, weight loss, night sweats, you think cancer, they're a bit younger um, and perhaps have a recent travel history, then you might think TB. And again, very, very important in every shortness of breath, OSCE station and in real life, ask for exercise tolerance. You'll get a point for this. How far can you walk? You know, can you walk 50 meters? Can you walk down a corridor? Can you walk to your toilet? Do you get breathless on standing up? These are basic questions you need to get. Uh, past medical history, again, straightforward. Just ask them what medical conditions they have. Specifically ask for PE risk factors. So any long haul travel, smoking, um, any recent DVTs, previous clotting problems, et cetera. Are they on the contraceptive pill? You know, these sort of questions to assess for PE risk factors, any cardiac risk factors, any previous chest infection. Um, drug history, family history, quite straightforward, but social history, smoking, smoking, smoking. You know, if you have a shortness of breath, history, you don't ask about smoking, you're missing a big chunk because that will guide you to the diagnosis. You should work out the pack years, okay? And you do that by multiplying the number of packs per day they smoke, multiplied by the total number of years they have smoked for. So if I have a patient who smokes 40 cigarettes per day for 20 years, what is their pack year history? So 40 cigarettes per day for 20 years. For those of you who don't know, there's 20 cigarettes in a pack, okay? So if they smoke 40 cigarettes per day, that's two packs a day. If they smoke two packs a day for 20 years, the pack years are 40, okay? Number of packs per day is two, number of years is 20, two times 20 is 40. Uh, and you've all said 40, so very good. Uh, and when you're presenting back your history to the examiner, when you get onto the smoking history, you'll say this patient is a smoker of 40 pack year history. Ask about their job, ask if there's any travel, have they been exposed to TB, ask about pets, do they have any allergies to those pets? And again, super important question, how is this affecting their activity of daily living? So is it affecting their work? Is it effect affecting their you know, general household chores? This is a really important question to ask because it shows you're taking a holistic approach to the history along with ideas, concerns, expectations. You get you know, really important marks for this and it leaves a good impression on your examiner. Investigations, so I mean, it depends on the condition, but observations, you know, what are their saturations, what are their respirate, etc. ECG, ABG, chest x-ray, peak flow, and we'll come on to this later. Some red flags. Remember, as I said, something that comes on quickly is more worrying than something that comes on slowly in general, okay? So sudden onset persistent shortness of breath should raise a red flag in your mind. If there are any cardiac symptoms like chest pain, which might suggest an MI, palpitations suggesting arrhythmia or heart failure symptoms, again, red flag. Are they systemically unwell? So what does a drowsy short of breath patient suggest to you? It could suggest a lot of things, but you know, what are the few things that come to your mind if the patient is drowsy and they're short of breath? 
sepsis is one, what's the other thing? So yeah, hypoxia, but even kind of more specifically. Yeah, so Neris has said it, CO2, CO2 retaining, so they're hypercapnic. If patients are short of breath, they've got COPD, they're retaining CO2, their CO2 levels start to build up, the CO2 will impair their cognition and drop their GCS. That's a really worrying sign. Okay. Drowsy and shortness of breath is not a good combination. Hemoptysis, you see that in infection, you see that in pulmonary embolism. And in general examination findings, hemodynamic instability, so that's a tachycardic and hypotensive patient. You can see that in lots of conditions, like a massive PE or sepsis. What are their oxygen saturations? Are they low? Do they have stridor? Is there evidence of upper airway obstruction? which might be caused by anaphylaxis, for example. Remember, as I said, GCS low is a bad sign. Absent breath sounds is a very bad sign. You can see that in severe asthma exacerbation. Um, so these are all red flags. Okay, have a read of the case. So we have a young man, breathless, Central chest pain worse on inspiration. Occasional smoker. Those are the examination findings and the observations. What's the diagnosis? So we've got PE and we've got pneumothorax. PE, pneumothorax, PE, pneumothorax, PE, pneumothorax. Okay. Uh, why would a young man get a PE? It's a bit of a rhetorical question, but young... Young men in general don't get PEs unless they are have some underlying medical condition. If they have a clotting problem, then they might, but it's, it's rare for a young man, even if they're a smoker, to get a clot, okay? It's very rare. Whereas a tall, slim, young man, that is the classic demographic for a spontaneous pneumothorax. Tall, skinny, male, breathless equals pneumothorax, okay? He's got pleuritic chest pain, which again is classic of a pneumothorax. Examination reveals quiet breath sounds on the left. In PE, you shouldn't really have, a, the breath sound shouldn't be affected. But in a pneumothorax, the breath sounds are quiet. Okay, so let us move on to the question. What is your management? Please don't answer in the chat. I'm going to bring up Menti. So if you go to menti.com and type in 86500384, you'll be able to answer this question. What is your management? So this is the pneumothorax here. It measures one centimeter at the hilum and three centimeters at the apex. The patient is breathless. What is your management? So just to clarify, if you want to answer, go to this website, www.menti.com. If you put in this code up here, 86500384, you will have access to the question and you'll be able to answer it. So I'll give you about half a minute to answer that. So we've got aspirate, chest drain, discharge, high flow oxygen, or pleuridesis. So the answer is aspiration, and I'll come on to tell you why. I mean, the main thing is you, you need to treat this, okay? You need to treat this, and I'll tell you why. Because the patient is short of breath. It doesn't matter what the size is so much, but the fact is the patient is short of breath. That's an indication for treatment. So it doesn't matter how big or small it is. If even if it's a tiny pneumothorax, but the patient is symptomatic, you need to treat it. And that's the first thing you'll do is aspirate. And I'll come on to the specific management in a few slides. 
you can't discharge the patient because he's breathless and his saturations were 91%. Pyridesis is something you consider in lot, like long-term recurrent pneumothoraces and um, high flow oxygen is something you use in a secondary pneumothorax. What is a pneumothorax? It's air in the pleural space. So going back to, um, going back to our anatomy, remember you have the lungs, you have the visceral pleura and the parietal pleura. If you have air collecting in that space, that's a pneumothorax. And it can be spontaneous or traumatic. So spontaneous means without trauma, essentially. And that's primary or secondary. Primary means there's no underlying lung disease. Secondary means there is underlying lung disease. In a traumatic pneumothorax, it's either tension or not tension. And I'll come into the tension stuff in, a, in the next couple of slides. Um, 24 per 100,000 cases per year in men. It's, it's more common in men, typically tall, slim, young men. Smoking increases your risk massively for both men and women. If you have underlying lung disease, that increases your risk of secondary pneumothorax. And if you have underlying connective tissue diseases like Marfan's and Ehlers-Danlos, you're more likely to develop a pneumothorax. And of course, trauma. Trauma can introduce air into the pleural space and cause a traumatic pneumothorax. Investigation, straightforward chest x-ray. To diagnose a pneumothorax this is really important, and I'll show you why later. To diagnose a pneumothorax, you need two things, absence of lung markings and a visible pleural edge. In tension pneumothorax, the mediastinum is shifted to one direction. The management for primary or secondary spontaneous pneumothoraces, I have a flow chart coming up, and for tension pneumothorax, you need urgent aspiration followed by a chest strain. Okay. And the place you aspirate, so when I say aspirate, you get a big cannula that you normally take blood, that you normally put into a vein. You get a cannula, the biggest one that you can find, and you put it in the fourth or fifth intercostal space, just in front of the mid axillary line. Okay, biggest cannula you can get, stab it in between the, in the intercostal space, and that will allow all of the air to come out and relieve the tension. And before it used to be in a second intercostal space, mid clavicular line, but recent guidelines have changed and it's now, this is the recommended space. So what does this show? Spot diagnosis. If you miss this, your patient dies, unfortunately. So it's a tension pneumothorax, yeah? Remember, how do we diagnose pneumothorax? two things, a visible pleural edge, so that's this line here, that's that line there, and absent lung markings. So there's no lung markings, it's just black. Can you see it's just blackness on this side? Whereas if you compare it to the other side, you can see all of these little white lines. All of these white lines are lung markings. Whereas here, this is just air in the pleural space and we've lost all of our lung markings and you can see a pleural edge here. So that's a pneumothorax. It's a tension pneumothorax because the mediastinum is shifted to the right. Okay, the heart is shifted to the right, the trachea is shifted to the right, um, and that is a big problem. The reason tension pneumothorax kills is because it essentially will squash your, on your heart and all the blood vessels. It can eventually cause tamponade and cut off your cardiac output. And it's very easily solved by stabbing a cannula into the fourth or fifth intercostal space. Okay, so this is one not to be missed. Um, what I'd say is, so this is a question for you guys. If you have a patient and you think clinically they have a tension in your thorax, would you get a chest x-ray or would you try and aspirate with a cannula? So yeah, if you, if you suspect a tension pneumothorax clinically without any imaging, you should treat them immediately before you get the chest x-ray, because by the time they've had the chest x-ray, they may, you know, they may have had a cardiac arrest. Um, the way you figure out clinically is because 
their trachea will be shifted. So in as part of your respiratory examination, you always check the tracheal position. You check the apex beat, the apex beat will be shifted. Um, you listen to the, to the lungs and you'll have absent breath sounds on the affected side. It can shift, the mediastinum can shift in either direction depending on which side the pneumothorax is on. It shifts in the opposite direction to the pneumothorax. So you've got a pneumothorax on the left, so the mediastinum shifts to the right. If the pneumothorax was on the right, the mediastinum would shift to the left. Okay, so going back to our question, our young man had a spontaneous pneumothorax. He had a primary pneumothorax because he, he didn't meet any of these criteria here. So he was less than 50. He didn't have significant smoking history. He didn't have underlying lung disease. So this is a primary pneumothorax. The next thing we need to look at is the size and the symptoms. So if either one of these criteria are met, either the size is greater than two at the hilum, or the patient is breathless, BTS guidelines say you aspirate, okay? So you don't necessarily need to put in a chest strain. Um, if it's bigger than two centimeters at the hilum, or they're breathless, you aspirate with a cannula, and then you check the size of the pneumothorax again. And if it's less than one centimeter, um, you can consider discharging them and reviewing them in clinic later. If you aspirate and it's not less than one centimeter, you end up sticking in a chest strainer and admitting the patient. So that's the primary pneumothorax. For a secondary pneumothorax, that's where the patient is older than 50 and they have significant smoking history or they have known underlying lung disease, for example, the patient has cystic fibrosis, then you go down this arm of the algorithm. And again, it's the same situation. You look at the size and the symptoms. So if it's bigger than two centimeters or they're breathless, you stick in a chest strain and admit the patient. If it's one to two centimeters, you aspirate. If it's less than one centimeter, you admit the patient for high flow oxygen, okay? So basically the moral of the story is, if it's secondary pneumothorax, the patient is always gonna need admission, either for aspiration, chest strain, or high flow oxygen. If it's a primary pneumothorax, you may be able to get away with aspirating and sending the patient home if the aspiration is successful. If aspiration isn't successful, you need to put in a chest strain and admit the patient. Uh, so you just see some questions coming through. What's the difference between aspiration and a chest strain? Good question. Aspiration is where you get a cannula. You put it into the patient's pleural space, get a syringe, stick it on the end of the cannula and pull off the air. So you aspirate the air. And that's it. You're done after a few minutes of pulling off the air. A chest strain is an actual tube which goes into the pleural space and it's left there for a, a period of time, say a couple of days. So that's why you need to admit the patient if you put in a chest strain. I hope that makes sense. Um, what's the reason for the new intercostal space guidelines? I'm not sure what the reason is. That's the ATLS guidelines from 2018, I believe. Um, and that's, it's still not wrong to go in the second intercostal space. And that's personally what I've done in the past, but, um, that's what the new latest guidelines are. Okay, next case. Intention pneumothorax, is there time for local anesthetic? I wouldn't personally bother. Um, you know, it might hurt the patient, but you'll save their life. So just be as quickly, just be as quick as possible. What is the diagnosis? So 55 year old, shortness of breath, productive cough, wheezy episodes, barrel chested, hyper resonant percussion note. Yes, good, COPD. Um, he's a bit breathless, his saturations are borderline low. Okay, 
Which of the following is most suggestive of COPD? Improvement of FEV1 of at least 12% post salbutamol, a reduced FEV1, a raised FEV1, reduced total lung capacity, or increased transfer factor. So this is where you need to know your spirometry. And this is why I put this question in. It's a bit tricky. So good question in the chat. So why do we aspirate in general primary versus chest strain for secondary? So I think the reason is secondary pneumothoraces, if they're not dealt with properly, they'll just come back and the success rate with um, aspiration alone is probably not as good as a chest strain. Okay, let's have a look. Okay, good, very good. That was a tricky question, but a lot of you got that right, so well done. Reduced FEV1 is the correct answer. So an improvement of the FEV1 of at least 12% post salbutamol is classic of asthma. Remember, COPD is irreversible. COPD is irreversible, so you shouldn't get much reversal of the FEV1 with bronchodilator. Reduced FEV1 is classic of obstructive diseases. It shouldn't be raised. The total lung capacity should be normal. Reduced total lung capacity, you see it in a fibrotic lung disease where the lungs are shrunken down. Transfer factor is reduced in COPD. Transfer factor is the measure of diffusion across the alveoli. Obviously in COPD, your diffusion is reduced. Your diffusion is re reduced, your transfer factor is reduced. So this is incorrect, it's not increased, it's reduced. What is COPD? It's irreversible airway obstruction, typically consisting of emphysema and chronic bronchitis. So here we have an example of emphysema. These are the alveoli. You have destruction of the um, alveoli and they become these big air sacs. If you compare that to this region here, which is normal, you can see these nice small alveoli tightly packed together. Whereas on this side, you have these big sacs. And because you have lower surface area, you're going to have less diffusion occurring, and that leads to hypoxia and hypercapnia. Essentially, diffusion capability in the lung is reduced in COPD, and you also get uh, the bronchi being affected by secreting mucus and becoming inflamed, and you get chronic bronchitis. Very common, fourth leading cause of death globally, common in older patients. Smoking is a huge and the biggest risk factor. Uh, pollution, occupational exposure to uh, a certain compound. And if you have COPD or specifically emphysema in a young patient, you need to think of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, which is a genetic condition. What other organ does alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency affect? It affects the lungs and lungs and liver. So patients will have liver cirrhosis at a young age, and they will have emphysema at a young age. Investigation spirometry, we'll come on to the actual spirometry graphs and things in a few slides, so don't worry if you don't understand it, I'll go through it. FEV1 over FVC of less than 70% or less than 0.7, and you don't get bronchodilator reversibility. The chest x-ray is hyperinflated. Okay, that's because it's an obstructive airway disease. Patients have trouble getting air out of the lungs. If you can't get air out of the lungs, it gets trapped in the lungs and they get hyper-expanded, barrel-chested, hyper-resonant percussion sounds and hyperinflation on the chest x-ray. The full blood count shows a secondary polycythemia, so that's a raised hemoglobin to compensate for the chronic hypoxia. If patients are chronically hypoxic, the way your body compensates is to raise the hemoglobin to increase oxygen transfer. 
ABG in an acute exacerbation, you want to check for the PO2 and the PCO2. Because remember, I said gas exchange in these patients is impaired. Their oxygen partial pressures are going to be low. And their carbon dioxide partial pressures will be high because the gas exchange is impaired. How do you manage COPD? Well, stable chronic COPD is managed with inhalers and long-term oxygen therapy in severe cases. Acute COPD, so patients presenting to the emergency department or to you know, paramedic or to physician's associate um, in a clinic, how are you going to treat them? Well, if, it's, if they don't need admission, you can just increase their inhalers. If you think you need to treat them more intensively, you can give them nebulizers. So specifically of short acting bronchodilators, such as salbutamol or ipratropium. You give them steroids, antibiotics if there's an underlying infection, controlled oxygen if they need it. Okay, you give them controlled oxygen. Don't give them high flow oxygen because that will push their carbon dioxide levels up. IV bronchodilators like theophylline may be used, and eventually these patients may need non-invasive ventilation or mechanical ventilation on ITU. Um, the key thing here is why do they need controlled oxygen? This is the really important thing to know. What happens if you give a high flow oxygen? If you give patients high flow oxygen who have got chronic long-standing COPD, you will push up their carbon dioxide levels. Okay. That's because these patients are chronically hypoxic. They've had hypoxia for a long, long time. And that's what drives their breathing. The fact that they have low oxygen levels, it's called the hypoxic drive. That's what drives their breathing. If all of a sudden you give them a bunch of oxygen, that's going to push up their oxygen levels and it's going to reduce their respiration rate because all of a sudden the brain thinks we've got tons of oxygen around here all of a sudden, so we don't need to breathe as fast. If you stop breathing as fast, what happens to your carbon dioxide? You're not going to blow off your carbon dioxide and it builds up in the blood. So your carbon dioxide levels start to raise and that can end up killing the patients. Um, at the same time, it's a fine balance because if the patient is hypoxic and they need oxygen, you need to give them oxygen quickly. So it is a fine balance, but in general, try and give it controlled if you can. Um, what's the diagnosis? So think back to what I said earlier about pneumothorax. What's the diagnosis here? So good, this is COPD. The reason I, I put this in here is because it looks a bit like they've got a pneumothorax at the basis. But remember I said two things, you need to have lack of lung markings and the presence of a pleural line. We've got lung markings down here and there is no pleural line. This line here is bilateral. This is a lady and these are the breast shadows, okay? And you can also see the nipple shadows here and here. So don't get confused. It's very easy to think this is a pneumothorax and this is the pleural line here. This is just a breast shadow. The reason this is COPD is because the lungs are hyperexpanded. They've got too much air in them. Uh, the easiest way to tell that is the diaphragm is flattened. Okay? Normally this right hemidiaphragm comes up like an arch, but here it's completely flat. So if we compare that to this hemidiaphragm here, you can see this right hemidiaphragm is higher than the left. It's nice and arched. And then if we go to this one, you can see the hemidiaphragms are flat. Um, you can also count the number of ribs, but I'm not gonna go into that right now. So this is what I wanna focus on is spirometry. Some basics, you've got the tidal volume, and that's the amount of air that you essentially breathe in and out in a standard breath, and it's typically around 500 mils. So you take in 500 mils, 
you breathe out 500 mils when you're at rest, not thinking about breathing. But obviously you can take in a much bigger breath than 500 mils. So if you try and take the biggest breath that you can, that takes us up to this peak here. And then if you blow out as much air as you can, that takes us to this trough here. And essentially, the vital capacity is the biggest breath that you can take in and then blow all the way out. Okay, so it's the biggest breath that you can take in and then blow all of that air out. That is your vital capacity. So right now, if you were to take the biggest huge breath that you can take, and then blow all of that air out, that is the equivalent of your vital capacity. Um, you can't blow all of the air out in your lungs. You'll always have some residual volume um, and you just can't blow that off, okay? And that's known as your residual volume. So now we go over to spirometry. You have obstructive conditions like COPD, asthma, bronchiectasis, and restrictive conditions like fibrosis, neuromuscular disorders, kyphoscoliosis, and thoracic deformities. In obstructive conditions, you can't get air out of the lungs. Okay, there's a trapping of air within the lungs. You struggle to get air out of the lungs. In restrictive conditions, you can't get air into the lungs. Okay, and that's really important. So remember, vital capacity is the biggest breath you can take, followed by blowing all of that air out. In obstructive conditions, the forced vital capacity, so the vital capacity is normal, but the FEV1 is reduced. So the reason the vital capacity is normal, because if you give these patients long enough, they can eventually blow all of the air out of their lungs. Okay, they can blow all of that air out, the FEV1 is, is the rate at which they blow out. Okay, So although they can blow all of the air out, it takes them a long time because they've got obstruction to airflow going out of the lungs. If they've got an obstruction, it's going to be difficult for them to blow off that air quickly. And so the FEV1, which measures the rate at which you blow off air, is reduced. And specifically, the FEV1 to FVC ratio is less than 70%. The total lung capacity is normal. In restrictive conditions, the lungs are shrunken. They're small, like in fibrosis. The total lung capacity is reduced. Because the lungs are smaller, they've got less air to blow out. They've got less air to take in and blow out. So their vital capacity is reduced. But the rate at which they can blow out, the FEV1 is generally normal because they have not got an obstruction to getting air out of the lungs. So the rate at which they can blow air out of the lungs is normal. So their FEV1 over FVC is raised. And that's the key distinction. I hope that makes sense. Fine, so this patient has stable COPD. What is our first line management? Someone asked about transfer factor. Transfer factor measures the rate of diffusion of carbon monoxide into the blood. So in general, for chronic lung conditions, transfer factor is reduced because most lung conditions reduce diffusion across the alveoli. Um, there's been another question about how to measure pneumothorax on a radiograph. So you measure the pneumothorax at the hilum, and I can show you that at the end. You measure it at the hilum according to the BTS guidelines. Okay, first line management is a short acting. It doesn't, it doesn't matter, you know, if they've got asthmatic features, if they've got what background they've got you start a short acting agent. This is the only short acting agent on this list. So ipratropium is the correct answer. 
first line management in stable COPD is to short, start a short acting bronchodilator. All the others are not short acting and therefore iprotropium is the correct answer. An alternative would have been salbutamol, but that's not on the list. So how do we manage COPD? If you suspect COPD from the history, you do spirometry. If their spirometry shows an obstructive pattern of FEV1 over FVC of less than 0.7, you commence the patients on a short acting agent. So short acting beta agonist like salbutamol or a short acting anti-muscarinic like iprotropium. Whoops. Um, if their symptoms are controlled, you don't need to do anything else other than continue them on that short acting agent. According to NICE guidelines, if their symptoms are not controlled, you look for features of asthma or steroid responsiveness. So these include things like, is there diurnal variation? Do they have raised eosinophils on their blood? Uh, do they have a past medical history of asthma? If they have any of these things, you commence a long acting beta agonist like salmeterol and an inhaled corticosteroid like beclometasone, for example. If there are no features of the things I mentioned, then you start a long acting beta agonist and a long acting anti-muscarinic. If their symptoms still aren't controlled, you put them on triple therapy. So LABA plus LAMA plus ICS, and all at the same time, you still continue the short acting agent. As the caveat, if the patient, if you decide to put the patient on a long acting anti-muscarinic, you need to make sure that they are not on a short acting anti-muscarinic as well. That's too much anti-muscarinic. If you wanna start them on a long acting anti-muscarinic, short acting agent has to be a beta agonist like salbutamol. So that's management of COPD in a nutshell. And we've done previous webinars on that. So please do check that out. Good, respiratory causes. So we've got COPD we've touched on. Um, need to decide if it's chronic or acute. Uh, the way you investigate it is spirometry and chest X-ray. Um, just to be clear, the management pathway that we discussed there was for chronic stable COPD. For acute COPD, remember you do controlled oxygen, nebulizers, steroids, etc. Asthma, the key difference here is asthma, they may, might not necessarily have a smoking history. Patients have diurnal variation in their shortness of breath, so it's worse in the morning, worse at night. They have a dry cough, not a productive cough. And the way you investigate it is with spirometry and fraction of exhaled nitric oxide. Okay, those are the two key investigations. According to NICE, you don't necessarily need to do a peak flow, but it can still be useful. And again, you can do a chest X-ray just to make sure you're not missing any other lung conditions. Um, but again, we've done a webinar on asthma and please do check out the asthma textbook section, which goes into this in a lot more detail. Interstitial lung disease, so that's essentially colloquially known as fibrosis. Idiopathic is the most common type. Other causes include autoimmune diseases. So an example would be rheumatoid arthritis, for example, sarcoidosis, cancer. There's a long list of causes of interstitial lung disease. But if we're talking about idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is the most common, they have chronic shortness of breath, dry cough, clubbing on examination, fine end in spiratory crackles, restrictive pattern on spirometry, uh, reticular nodular shadowing on chest x-ray, and you may see honeycombing on a CT. So these are all just key words that you need to know. And it's a restrictive pattern on spirometry for interstitial lung disease, as we discussed. But COPD and asthma are obstructive. Um, pneumothorax we've touched upon, remember it can be spontaneous or traumatic. Pneumonia, um, again you get short of breath, pleuritic chest pain, productive cough, 
fever and the key way you can examine for a pneumonia in your investigations is inflammatory markers and a chest x-ray calculate your curb 65 score you know conduct a sputum culture and finally pe that presents with shortness of breath with pleuritic chest pain and they may have risk factors for an underlying pe like long haul travel make sure you either do a CTPA or D-dimer, depending on what the Wells score is. And we touched upon this last week. Okay, next case, what's the diagnosis? So 60 year old, eight week history of central chest discomfort, and shortness of breath brought on by walking. 20 cigarettes per day and his obs are largely normal. So this is stable angina, okay? Stable angina. He's got chest pain worse on walking, shortness of breath worse on walking. Um, that's classic of angina. It's not heart failure because heart failure, you wouldn't necessarily get the chest discomfort. You've given the patient a GTN spray. What's the next step? They've got, a, so remember, it's stable angina. He's got a background of asthma. He's largely well otherwise. So what's your next step? So why not bisoprolol? What did the patient have in their history? So they were asthmatic. The management of angina is with a calcium channel blocker or a beta blocker. So there's a little trip. It's classic of an exam question, okay? So he's asthmatic. Classic exam question, and they'll, they'll throw in the asthma bit to try and throw you off, but the answer is verapamil. So you either use a calcium channel blocker or a beta blocker. Use a non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker first line, such as verapamil. Amlodipine is a dihydropyridine, so it's not tend to use first line. Uh, Isozolbide mononitrate is not first line. And verapamil and bisoprolol is a bad combination that can cause heart to block and severe bradycardia. You don't combine non-dihydropine uh, calcium channel blockers like verapamil with beta blockers because they cause third degree heart block. You can combine a dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker like amlodipine with a beta blocker if needed. Different types of angina. Stable means it's brought on, it's ischemic heart disease essentially, which is brought on by exertion. Chest pain brought on by exertion. Atherosclerotic coronary arteries causes the chest pain. And it's worse on exertion because your myocardial oxygen demand increases on exertion. Unstable angina is part of acute coronary syndrome, and that's a medical emergency, um, and it occurs at rest. So unstable angina and NSTEMI are treated in exactly the same way. Again, we touched upon this in my last webinar on chest pain and acute coronary syndrome. Uh, these are two rare things. So decubitus angina is where you have chest pain brought on by lying flat. And Prinz metal angina is where you have intermittent coronary artery spasm causing chest pain. According to NICE, 2 million people in the UK have currently or have had in the past angina. So very common. First line, ECG. Okay, so make sure that they're not having a myocardial infarction, firstly. And secondly, you might see chronic features of ischemia, like left bundle branch block. According to NICE, if they've got angina, and that's your working diagnosis, they can also have a CT coronary angiogram, which looks at the coronary arteries. And you can see 
if there's significant stenosis, for example. If the diagnosis is still unclear from the history and your investigation's first line, you can do functional imaging. So a stress echo is an example of one of those where the patient does some exercise and they do an echocardiogram to see the structure of the heart um, and if there's any impact of the exercise on the heart. And finally, if all of that's not clear, you can conduct invasive angiography where you inject a dye into the coronary arteries in a cath lab. Okay, so you can inject dye from the femoral vessels, for example. You insert a catheter into or near the coronary arteries and inject some dye and then take some x-rays and you can see the perfusion of the coronary arteries in real time. The management is you modify the risk factors and you give them anti-anginal medication. First line is beta blocker or a non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker. You can use either. Second line is dual therapy, so a beta blocker and a calcium channel blocker, but remember it has to be dihydropyridine, not non-dihydropyridine, because otherwise you'll cause heart block. Um, and finally, if they're still not getting on well, you can consider other things like isosorbide mononitrate, uh, evabridine, cardiac resynchronization, sorry, not cardiac resynchronization therapy, um, percutaneous coronary intervention is what I meant. Good, final case. What's the diagnosis here? So we've done the respiratory causes of shortness of breath, and then we did stable angina, which is a cardiac cause of shortness of breath. And now we've got an elderly patient coming in with breathlessness, orthopnea, basal crackles and a raised JVP. So this is heart failure. Okay, this is another cardiac cause of shortness of breath. You suspect the patient has heart failure. What New York Health Association class is she in? So I know it's overrun a little bit. We should hopefully finish up in the next five or so minutes. So we've got a split between class two and three. So one and four, then not many takers for that, but we've got two and three. So it's actually class two. So class one means no limitation of activity. Class four means symptoms at rest. And then two and three are kind of in between. Two is mild and three is marked. Okay, so, two. so if we go back to the case, she's fine walking on flat ground, but her breathlessness is only walking, brought upon by walking up the stairs. So it's fairly mild. Okay, so I'll say this patient is class two. Heart failure is where the cardiac output is unable to meet your metabolic demands, and it's either left-sided, right-sided, or both, which is known as congestive. Common as we become more old, so one in 35 people in the 65 to 74 year age bracket. Um, underlying risk factors, age, anything that's gonna affect your heart pumping, okay? Ischemic heart disease. If you have valvular disease, that decreases the efficiency of your heart. Arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation decrease the efficiency. Cardiomyopathy means the heart can't pump as effectively. Core pulmonale is where you have respiratory disease, causes pulmonary hypertension, which can subsequently lead to right heart failure because the right heart is having to pump against high pressures. And renal failure is closely linked with heart failure as well. Patient has a BMP of 782. What is your next step? 
So urgent echo, echo in two weeks, six weeks, or eight weeks, or none of the above. So it's an echo in six weeks, okay? This patient has probably had heart failure for a while. It's been getting worse. Their BMP is 782. This relies on the NICE guidelines. First thing you do is you do an ECG. Um, they may have evidence of left ventricular hypertrophy, for example. Um, the next thing you want to do is this blood test called the NT Pro BNP. You can also use an alternative blood test called BNP. This is just the precursor and the one that NICE recommends. And if it's greater than 400, echo in six weeks, greater than 2000, echo in two weeks. And if they're presenting with acute heart failure, you do an urgent echo ideally on the same day. So when we say acute, we mean they come to hospital, their oxygen saturations are low, so less than 94%. They're very breathless. You can't discharge them safely. That's acute heart failure. So this patient didn't have that. Um, so as we said, you do an echocardiogram and you're looking for the left ventricular ejection fraction. Okay, so you're looking for the left ventricular ejection fraction. That's essentially a measure of how efficient and powerful the left ventricular ventricle is contracting. And then chest X-ray to look for pulmonary edema. The management is fairly straightforward. So beta blocker and an ACE inhibitor, both of them, you start one at a time and then you introduce the other one. And then you can also use a loop diuretic if the patient has too much fluid on board, the diuretic can help them pee off that excess fluid. An aldosterone antagonist is second line if their symptoms are still not controlled. Um, and beyond that, further treatments are digoxin, particularly if the patient has atrial fibrillation, ibabradine, sacubutral valsartan. Eventually, if you can't control the patient's symptoms, they will need cardiac resynchronization therapy. So that's where the patient has a pacemaker-like device implanted, and it makes sure that both ventricles contract at the same time. That helps improve the efficiency of the heart and can improve patient symptoms. If the patient presents acutely, then you need to give them oxygen, IV diuretics to shift all of that excess fluid, IV nitrates, inotropes. These are things which make the heart pump more powerfully. So obviously, if in heart failure, your heart isn't pumping efficiently, you can give them inotropes to boost the efficiency and power of the heart. And eventually, if they're still not getting on well, they will need some form of ventilation. This is a chest X-ray of a patient with heart failure and pulmonary edema. What are these lines pointing to? These arrows pointing to, sorry? Yeah, so do dobutamine is an example of an inotrope. Indications for a CRT, um, off the top of my head, they need to have a broad QRS complex, and there are a few others that um, I can't remember off the top of my head. These are curly B lines, okay? So these are curly B lines, and they represent fluid in the interstitium. Other features, the patient's got a right side, a left-sided pleural effusion. They've got fluid in the horizontal fissure, okay? So left-sided pleural effusion, septal lines, fluid in the horizontal fissure, perihyler, the perihyler opacification here, this is all consistent with pulmonary edema. Yeah, and he's got stenotomy wires as well. Stenotomy wires there. Okay. Cardiovascular causes, acute coronary syndrome, so shortness of breath with central chest pain, they're going to have a raised troponin. They'll have ECG changes suggestive of acute coronary syndrome. Aortic dissection, so they get shortness of breath with central chest pain tearing through to the back. Um, they'll have radial radial delay, difference in blood pressure between the arms, um, and a, you need to do a CT aortogram to show the dissection. And we touched on this last week. 
Another cause of acute shortness of breath are arrhythmias, um, such as atrial fibrillation, for example. If your heart's not pumping efficiently because of an arrhythmia, that will make you short of breath. And arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation are often triggered by infections, electrolyte problems. So make sure you check those. Check the ECG to see what the type of arrhythmia is, and also do an echocardiogram um, to check the ejection fraction. Stable angina, we just touched on, and that's the classic shortness of breath on exertion with chest pain worse on exertion as well, and heart failure we just touched on. Shortness of breath, orthopnea, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, peripheral edema, they can get a cough as well, and essentially BMP, chest x-ray, echocardiogram, and an ECG as well to investigate. Uh, other, remember, don't forget sepsis, DKA, and anaphylaxis. I'm not going to go into these now, but these are just key things to be aware of if a patient does present with acute shortness of breath. The slides will be there for you guys to have a look through this in your own time. Okay, so as I said, do check out our textbook. We've got textbook sections on all of these topics um, that I mentioned today in the cases, and it goes through them in detail, right from pathophysiology down to management. Uh, use my discount code and you can get 20 to 30% off. For those of you asking about um, recordings, they are all uploaded onto our website under the watch tab. If you have access to premium membership, then you get access to all the recordings. If you don't have the premium membership, you still get access to a vast majority of the recordings. So please do check that out. And thank you so much for tuning in. Um, please do fill out the feedback form and post any questions you have in the Q&A. Um, you're all very welcome. Remember as a recap, Acute and chronic is the key distinction to make in your mind, and then decide is it respiratory, cardiovascular, or other. That's the QR code for the feedback form. I shall post it again in the chat. You're all very welcome. Thank you for your kind words.